Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video in my history series. I am loving my history videos at the moment, I love filming and researching everything for my history series so I hope you guys feel the same, I hope you are enjoying it as well. But today I have a history video for you that is probably one of my most requested videos ever. You guys have really wanted to see this one and I'm happy to oblige. This is going to be the story of the Romanov family, a name you probably recognise, if not from history then from the 20th century Fox movie Anastasia, which is actually one of my favourite animated films of all time and despite popular belief, it's not a Disney film. But real life is never quite like the movies and Anastasia is no exception. So I figured we'd start with a brief synopsis of the Romanovs before really diving into this video. The Romanovs were the Royal House of Russia, the Imperial family from 1613 to 1917. Over the three centuries they held power, there were 18 different Romanovs on the throne, ending with Tsar Nicholas II. Then the Russian Revolution took place and Bolshevik revolutionaries toppled the throne, ending the Romanov dynasty forever. Tsar Nicholas II was executed by Bolshevik troops along with his entire family, his wife Empress Alexandra and their five children, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia and Alexei, along with many others close to the family. But for many years the rumours persisted that one of the children escaped the execution, young Anastasia. This element of mystery alongside tragedy has ensured that the story of the Romanovs has never been forgotten. So that's the quick synopsis of the Romanovs, so you have an idea of what we're getting into here. But let's get all history, starting with the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks later became known as the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, also occasionally known as the Reds. They were a revolutionary party in Russia, the average party member was younger, mostly under the age of 30, and they were mainly the working class, industrial workers, peasants, farmers, who were pretty much just sick of the rich, the upper classes, controlling everything. Now we're talking a very basic summary here, Bolshevism could be a whole other video in itself but you do need a small understanding of it for this video. They basically wanted to establish a socialist society based on equality, no classes, no rich, no poor. The leader of the Bolsheviks was a man you've probably heard of called Vladimir Ulyanov, more widely known as Lenin. Bolsheviks weren't really fans of the royal family because they represented everything they were fighting against power, inordinate wealth, classism. In the early 1900s, Russia was one of the most impoverished countries in Europe. It was incredibly poor and people led really tough lives. The people in the countryside struggled to find work and grow food due to the very harsh weather conditions and the cities were overcrowded and busy, people living in destitute conditions and again they struggled to find work and when they did it was usually in factories. Very hard work, very little pay. In 1905 there was what was known as the Bloody Sunday Massacre. The working class held huge protests in the street of St Petersburg, then known as Petrograd, against the monarchy. Tsar Nicholas II had been on the throne since 1894 and Russia wasn't doing well for all of the reasons I just mentioned. Hundreds of unarmed protesters took to the streets in protest of the Russian conditions, marching to the Winter Palace to make their demands. Only the Imperial forces opened fire, killing and wounding hundreds. So riots break out across the country. Nicholas eventually makes a whole load of promises to work towards reform, only he soon goes back on all these promises and people are left in the same position or worse off than they were before Bloody Sunday. And then in 1914, World War One breaks out. Russia is at war with Germany and of course the working class make up the Russian army. They're ill-equipped and untrained and they're basically just sent out to the field to die, which they do. The whole involvement in the war was disastrous for the Russian Empire and people were not happy about it. Millions died, the Tsar took command of the military himself when he really had no idea what he was doing, there were food and fuel shortages, the economy suffered big time. People were just really not very happy with what was going on. Which brings us to 1917. More protests and more striking is happening within the working class. The Tsar was messing up repeatedly and he had to go. 
and so happens the February Revolution, which actually happened on March 8th, 1917, according to our Gregorian calendar, but it was February 23rd in Russian's Julian calendar, so the February Revolution. Demonstrators took to the streets of Petrograd for days on end. The army were called in and told to open fire on the protesters, but by this point, a lot of the army were also fed up with the monarchy and they kind of agreed with the protesters, so a lot of them refused to open fire. Eventually, the Tsar has no choice but to abdicate the throne, bringing an end to over three centuries of Romanov rule. A new provisional government is formed, with a few people chosen to stand and represent the voice of the people. Although these people chosen were still all the bourgeoisie. They establish a liberal government with freedom of speech, equality and the right to unions, and they opposed a violent social revolution. But the war effort did continue under this provisional government, despite pretty much everyone being against it, and Russia's food and fuel shortages surprisingly continued. Weirdly, a brand new government didn't fix everything overnight. Which brings us to the Bolshevik Revolution, sometimes called the October Revolution, except it happened on November 6th and 7th, 1917. The Bolshevik Party, led by Lenin, launched a coup d'etat against the provisional government. Lenin didn't want the rich to still be in power, he wanted a government ruled by the people, by the workers. The Bolsheviks marched to Petrograd and they begin to occupy government buildings before storming and capturing the Winter Palace. Bolshevik guards arrested the ministers, bringing the provisional government to an end. Lenin takes power and communism begins. This video is still about the Romanovs, I promise. You just need a bit of context as to how things went down here. But let's delve back into the Romanovs because they had some stuff going on themselves. So Tsar Nicholas had taken power in 1894, succeeding his father. He marries Princess Alex of Hesse from Germany in the same year, shortly after his coronation. She would later be known by the name Alexandra, and she was a daughter of our very own Queen Victoria. Together, Nicholas and Alexandra had four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria and Anastasia, and one son, Alexei. Despite the public opinion of the royal family, there's no denying that Nicholas was a family man. He loved his wife and he loved his children and he spoiled them completely. They were a devoted family, as close as any family could be. Alexei was the rightful heir to the throne, but Nicholas was terrified that his line would not continue. You see, Alexei was a sick child and suffered from haemophilia, a rare genetic disorder that affects the blood's ability to clot. When a healthy person cuts themselves, clotting factors in the blood combine with platelets to clot the blood and make you stop bleeding pretty quickly. Haemophiliacs don't have as many clotting factors as they should have in the blood and therefore they bleed for longer. The symptoms can be mild to severe but from what I can understand, Alexei had it pretty bad. Bad enough for Nicholas to worry that he would not live long enough to take the throne. Fun fact, haemophilia is sometimes known as the royal disease because it's so prevalent in European royal bloodlines. As we know, it's genetic and European royal families would often marry into each other. And it's much more common in men, whilst women tend to be carriers without symptoms. It's thought it actually came from Alexandra's side of the family, Queen Victoria. Due to Alexei's delicate disposition, his illness, he was particularly doted on by his family. His health was kind of at the centre of everything the family did, and Alexei was particularly close with his mother, who would sleep on the floor beside his bed whenever he had a bout of his illness. A single cut for Alexei could trigger catastrophe and near death which would not only be a tragedy for the family, but also would be a huge threat to the whole Romanov dynasty. And of course, this worry made the family very vulnerable. And this is where a man called Grigory Rasputin comes into the picture. You know, the evil guy in the Anastasia cartoon who sells his soul in exchange for a reliquy that he uses to place a curse on the Romanovs. Cartoon Rasputin then spends years in purgatory with limbs and eyeballs popping out left, right and centre, before his bat minion Bartok comes to the rescue. Anyway, this isn't about a cartoon, this is about real life. Grigory Rasputin was a self-proclaimed holy man, born in Western Siberia, and for all intents and purposes, he was a peasant. He leaves Siberia and apparently enters the monastery with intentions of becoming a monk, 
but he leaves soon after to go and get married. So he marries, he has children, and then spends many years just wandering around Europe. He cultivates this reputation of being a mystical healer and in 1905 enters Petrograd and he assimilates himself in with the church. He requests one day an audience with the royal family, something he is granted, and he presents them with a hand-painted wooden icon of Saint Simeon, who was a Siberian saint. And for some reason, the family really took a liking to him, Alexandra in particular. This mystic healer has surely been sent from God to help them with their ailing son. These perfect conditions allowed Rasputin to assimilate himself into the most powerful family in Russia. But of course, Rasputin was not a good man and a lot of people really did not like him, which put the royals in a very precarious position. They're already the subject of much distrust throughout Russia and now they've got this man in their midst who they're putting unwavering trust in. And this man, Rasputin, is seen by most Russians as nothing more than a religious charlatan. Politicians and journalists across Russia use the royal family's association with Rasputin to question their credibility. He claims to have become one of Alexandra's personal advisors, and rumours became rampant that their relationship was more than platonic. However, it's likely they actually spread a lot of these rumours himself, and he was never anything more than a healer for Alexei. Then World War I comes around and it's reported that Rasputin claimed to Nicholas that the Russian armies would not be successful unless the Tsar personally went and took command. So Nicholas did just that, he did what this mystical religious man told him to do. Now Nicholas was not a man suited to rule, he firmly believed in his divine right to rule that he'd been chosen by God to do so, but he was not good at it. He was very uncharismatic, uninspired and indecisive. He was a lovely man, he just wasn't a ruler. Some even described him as dull and said that he had so few ideas of his own that pretty much every order Nicholas made was on the advice of somebody else. So he was more than willing to head out to war when Rasputin suggested it to him. But with the Tsar away, Empress Alexandra was left with a lot of the power. Just like Rasputin and her husband, Alexandra was also disliked by the Russians because she was a woman of Anglo-German descent. They didn't trust her, particularly at this time when Russia was at war with Germany. A lot of people suspected that Alexandra was just a spy for her home country. And it really didn't help that Alexandra made it quite obvious that she wasn't much of a fan of Russia and Russian culture in general but she wasn't a spy. In Nicholas's absence, Alexandra begins firing elected officials who openly distrusted her beloved Rasputin, whilst Rasputin himself is becoming more and more powerful. Nobody trusted him apart from Alexandra, so a group of conspirators, including the Tsar's own cousins, plot to kill Rasputin, viewing him as a threat to the entire empire. In December 1916, a group led by Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich Prince Felix Yusupov and right-wing politician Vladimir Purishkevich law Rasputin to the Moika Palace. I am about to seriously butcher some Russian pronunciation here. So they law Rasputin to the Moika Palace where they offer him food and drink laced with cyanide. Miraculously, Rasputin's not affected by the poison at all, despite drinking three glasses of wine laced with it. When that doesn't work, they decide to just shoot him with a revolver. The story goes that Dmitri then takes the revolver and shoots Rasputin in the chest. They believe that he's dead, but then he suddenly leaps up and begins attacking them, managing to escape out of the palace door. Eventually he's shot again and collapses in the courtyard. That's just how the legend goes, but we do know for certain that Rasputin did have three gunshot wounds, one of them in his forehead. Maybe Rasputin really did have healing powers, cyanide didn't affect him, a shot in the chest didn't affect him. The three men dump his body off the Petrovsky Bridge into the river and his body is found just a couple of days later. Dmitri and Felix would later claim that they had acted to preserve the Romanov dynasty, that Rasputin was a threat they had to deal with. But perhaps they acted a little bit too late as the revolution was already underway and the February revolution would take place just a couple of months later. There was already this distrust in the royal family. After the February revolution, the Romanovs found themselves in a very precarious position to say the least. Nicholas had been stripped of his title by the provisional government and he simply was just Nicholas Romanov. The imperial family just no longer existed. 
They're kept at the Alexander Palace in Sakoye Selo, just outside of St. Petersburg, under house arrest. Although there are many reports that Nicholas actually thrived in this new life, he was never really cut out to be a ruler anyway, and now he could just spend time with his family in the countryside and relax. Yes, they were technically under house arrest, yes, every move they made was watched, but the family still had their luxuries, they still had this big palace to live in, they had all their home comforts, they had their servants, and they had each other. In August 1917, the provisional government evacuated the family to Tobolsk, allegedly to protect them from the incoming revolution, and so they stay in Tobolsk for a while. But then the Bolsheviks come into full power in October, and things start to get not so nice for the family, because the provisional government, you've got to remember, were still rich people, were high ups in society, they still liked the royal family, they just weren't royal anymore. But the Bolsheviks hated the royal family, and when they take power, any possible escape route for the family closes, and the Romanovs become captives in the truest sense of the word. By March 1918, the family are on full soldiers' rations, with no home comforts, although they did still have a few servants. The Romanovs always believed that one day they would be free. They didn't imagine that they were going to end up dead. In April 1918, the family are relocated to their final home, Ipatiev House in Ekaterinburg, in the Ural Mountains, which was the most radicalised city in Russia at the time. Ekaterinburg was strongly communist and anti-imperial. It was Siberia, way, way out and far away from anyone who would be sympathetic to the family's cause. It's reported that whilst on the train to Ekaterinburg, Nicholas stated, I would go anywhere at all, just not to the Urals. The family were kept in darkness, literally. The windows were covered with newspapers so they couldn't see out and people couldn't see in. They weren't allowed visitors, they weren't allowed to read the newspapers. Any food that was brought in for them was quickly raided by the guards. Their life was a far cry from what it was just two years, 18 months beforehand. Although a lot of the guards did actually sympathise with the Romanovs and their plight. These guards have spent their whole lives hating this imperial family, hating the idea of Tsar Nicholas, but yet when they met him, they couldn't help but like him and feel sorry for him. That was the kind of person he was, a clueless ruler, but a really nice guy. In July 1918, four housemaids are allowed to enter to clean Ipatiev house and they're instructed not to engage with the family in any way. Yurovsky keeps a close eye on them, but the maids would later say that the family, particularly Alexei, appeared very delicate and sad. At this point, Nicholas was 50, Alexandra 46, Olga 22, Tatiana 21, Maria, or Marie, she was sometimes known, 19, Anastasia 17, and Alexei 13. Alexei was getting sicker by the day at this point, having not been allowed access to a doctor for many, many months. For a long time, the Bolsheviks had been bickering between themselves as to what should be done with the Romanovs. It had been clear to them from the get-go that they couldn't just be released, but some people wanted there to be a public trial of the former Tsar, that he should pay for the damage he caused whilst he was in charge. Lenin wanted to keep the family alive so he could use them as pawns in the war against Germany. Germany were invested in German Alexandra, after all. Some people just wanted them executed on the spot. But whilst all of this was going on, a civil war had also broken out in Russia. Russia was having a really tough time of it. It was the Reds, the Bolsheviks, against the Whites, the anti-communists. The White Army were threatening to capture Ekaterinburg, and the fear was that the Romanovs would fall back into their hands in the process. And of course, this couldn't be allowed because the Whites would just use them as a symbol of anti-communism. It was at the end of June that the decision was made by the Ural Regional Soviet that the Tsar should be executed. A telegram arrived in Moscow on the 3rd of July, telling everyone what they were going to do. But this was just about the Tsar's execution. What people didn't know is secretly the execution of the entire family was discussed, but it was kept under wraps because of the political repercussions that this could cause. They could justify killing the Tsar because of the distress he'd caused whilst he was in power. But the children were just children. They'd committed no crimes. It was very controversial. On the night of July 17th, after 78 days at Ipatiev, the family and their four servants were woken at 1.30am. Yurovsky informed them that a civil war was threatening the city and they needed to go down to the basement for their own safety. Only he was leading them unknowingly to their deaths. The four others were Eugene Botkin, Anna Demidova, 
Ivan Krotonov and Alexei Trupp. They all gathered together in a small room in the basement, nobody showing any signs of resistance. Anastasia had even brought her dog, Jemmy, with her. Alexandra immediately assisted on a chair to sit on though, and Yurovsky obliged by providing her with two chairs, on which she and Alexei sat, pillows put behind their backs by the daughters. Yurovsky explained that he needed to take a photograph because people in Moscow were worried that they'd escaped. So he arrayed the prisoners in two rows up against the wall. Nicholas stood by Alexei's chair and the daughters were arranged behind Alexandra and the others stood behind Nicholas and Alexei. Once he was happy with the arrangement, Yurovsky calls in 11 men with revolvers, not a photographer, and reads a statement aloud. In view of the fact that your relatives are continuing their attack on Soviet Russia, the Ural Executive Committee has decided to execute you. Nicholas says, what? To which Rovsky calmly repeats the statement and shoots the former Tsar at point blank range, killing him immediately. At this, everyone else begins to shoot, 12 men firing at the wall of prisoners. Alexandra dies straight away in her chair, Olga killed with a single bullet through her head. Botkin, Trump and Karatinov also died quickly. The story goes that Demidova, Alexei, Maria, Anastasia and Tatiana refused to die, the bullets literally ricocheting off their skin. But they were only human and eventually they succumbed. It was later discovered that they'd sewn diamonds into their clothes to hide them and this had acted like armour. Yurovsky personally killed Alexei with two shots through his ear. Anna Demidova was the last to die, putting up one hell of a fight before being stabbed with a bayonet. Now the executioners were to check everyone's pulses, ensuring they were dead, before wrapping them up in sheets and carrying them to a truck waiting outside the building. The whole thing took 20 minutes in total. 20 minutes for the Romanov dynasty, ruling over three centuries to end. Two days before the execution, Yurovsky had gone with one other into the local forest to look for a place to bury the bodies. Eventually, they settled on a site known as the Four Brothers, at which there were multiple empty pits from years of digging for coal and peat. It was the perfect gravesite, the graves were already dug for the Soviets. After the execution, the bodies are transported to the Four Brothers. The bodies are stripped, at which point they find the 18 pounds of diamonds sewn into the girls' clothes, and the clothes are burned. The bodies are thrown into the mine shaft and several hand grenades are thrown in after them in an attempt to collapse the shaft, thus burying the Romanovs forever. Yurovsky thinks that his work is done and he leaves, only that's not quite how it goes. One week after the execution, the Whites take control of Katerinburg. They rush to Ipatiev House to find the royal family and they find they're not there and the search proves fruitless but they do note that the basement room looks a little bit dodgy. There's a lot of blood clinging to the floorboards and a hell of a lot of bullet marks on the floor and the walls. So the Whites had their suspicions, but no confirmation about what had happened, as the Bolsheviks didn't make it common knowledge that they'd seen through the execution. It was six months later in January 1919 when the Whites hired Nicholas Sokolov, a professional investigator, for the task of tracking down the Romanovs, dead or alive. And it wasn't hard, because as soon as the snow melted in the spring, Nicholas Sokolov noticed deep ruts from the carts carrying the bodies headed through the forest, leading straight to the Four Brothers. The pits were now full of water, with burned wood floating on the surface. There were obvious traces of a bonfire and hand grenade marks on the walls of the pit. Sokolov orders the water out of the pit and gets to work, finding a large number of articles belonging to the family belts, jewellery, medals, and a few charred bones, along with a severed human finger. They even find the charred remains of Anastasia's beloved dog, Jemmy. But other than that, there's no human bodies there. So Sokolov finds one of the executioners who are present at the execution and interrogates him, who confirms there were 11 people murdered at the execution. As far as this person knew, the bodies were buried at the Four Brothers site. In the end, Sokolov concludes that indeed the bodies were buried at the Four Brothers, but Yurovsky had returned the following day and destroyed the bodies by chopping them up and burning them to ash, hence the bonfire marks. And for many, many years, it was just assumed that this is what happened, that Yurovsky had returned and burned the bodies. Spoiler alert, there's more. Yurovsky returned to Katerinburg after the burials, only to find the entire city talking about where the family had been buried, 
the four brothers. Apparently, some of the guards who were present just couldn't quite keep their mouths shut. Yurovsky knew that a new burial site was needed, and fast, especially because the White Army was advancing by the day. Yurovsky and some trusted men this time return back to the burial site and they bring the bodies up from the mine, one by one. At 8pm they set off in carts with the bodies to a new site they'd found, a new set of deep mines about 20 miles away. Only at 4.30am the carts get stuck in the deep mud and they can't go any further. The bodies are just going to have to be buried where they are. Yurovsky decides that for some reason he wants to burn the bodies of Alexei and Alexandra, but he later realises that he may have mistaken Alexandra's body for Anna's, the maid. So Yurovsky and the guards burn these two bodies, the male and the female, then they bury these two bodies underneath the bonfire site, before digging a common grave for the rest, six foot deep and eight foot wide. The remaining bodies are placed in this grave and they're doused with sulfuric acid before the pits filled in, covered with boards and driven over over to ensure that it's all hidden. And this is where the family would remain for many, many years. It was a place called Pig's Meadow in Koptiaki, 12 miles northwest of Ekaterinburg. But it was 1979 when a Ekaterinburg native called Alexander Advenin and a filmmaker called Gail Ryabov decided to dedicate their spare time to locating the Romanovs, convinced that Sokolov had got it wrong. Rybov locates the oldest son of now-dead Jurovsky, a man called Alexander Jurovsky, who simply hands over a copy of his father's report on the execution of the Romanov family, the report in which he details the disposal of the bodies. Alexander said that he wanted to repent for his father's sins and this was a way of doing so. So Avdanin and Rybov have confirmation in this report that the bodies remained intact at a different location. They weren't at the Four Brothers as Sokolov had insisted and they were going to do what they could do to find them. Which they did. In late May 1979, they and a team begin to dig at the site at Pig's Meadow, having tracked it down using the description in the report. They eventually hit these wooden boards. They continue digging and sure enough, they find human bones. Now this wasn't a professional dig by any means. They were on a mission to uncover a 50 year old mystery. But with the knowledge that they'd found the grave, they simply fill the pit back in and they leave, taking three skulls with them. They believe that one of these skulls belonged to the Tsar, one was Alexei's and one was one of the daughters. And they sort of just shared the skulls between the two of them. They intended to carry out testing to confirm if these were indeed the remains of the Romanovs. But they had to be really discreet about it because politics was still very shaky in Russia at this time. Rybov hoped to get testing done, only he is repeatedly rebuffed. Nobody wanted to be involved in this. Nobody wanted to be testing the skulls of the Romanovs. It was still a very touchy subject. Avdanin was too scared to even try and get testing, so he just kept his skull under his bed. In 1980, scared of the repercussions of their actions, they simply decide just to return the skulls back to the grave, which is where they remain for yet another decade. They don't really tell anyone of what they found. The end of the 80s spelled the downfall of the Soviet Union though, and communist rule comes to an end. Politics is at peace, and now is the right time for Adnan to come out with what he discovered all those years earlier. On July 11th, 1991, the military set out at Katerinburg, carrying everything they need for a professional exhumation. They reach the burial site and they begin to dig, coming across the three skulls that had been reburied in a wooden box. They find all of the skeletons lying in disarray, one on top of the other at all angles. The bodies have been given no consideration at their burial, they were simply just thrown in there and left where they lay. And the bodies were in terrible condition, the bones crushed and broken, destroyed by all the acid and the pressure. But the professionals slowly begin to realise that there were only nine bodies in this pit, and they knew for a fact that 11 had been executed, so there were two missing. Could it be that someone had escaped? 
Sergei Abramov had the job of identifying these bones, confirming that these indeed are the bodies that everyone thinks they are. Piece by piece, these tiny bone fragments are put together, a skeletal puzzle. This was a time when DNA testing was inaccessible, so that wasn't really an option for the Russians. They needed full skeletons to confirm who was who and if it was indeed the Romanovs. They had to use skull shapes compared to photographs to make their matches, using maths here more than science. A technique that had actually never been used before, the Russians invented it for this. As a result, they were pretty sure that this was the Romanov family, and they eventually identify a huge amount of the bodies, but without DNA testing, they couldn't be 100% sure. Surprisingly, the scientists weren't given a huge amount of money to help out with this. They could only do what they could do with the things, the tools they had. By the summer of 1992, Abramov was convinced that they'd found Nicholas, Alexandra, Olga, Anastasia, Tatiana, Botkin, Demidova, Karitinov, and Trupp. That's right, everyone thought that Anastasia had been found. At first, she wasn't the missing princess at all. Maria was the missing one, along with Alexei. It was only when an American doctor got involved, Dr. William Maple, did he conclude that body number five was actually Maria, not Anastasia. Maria was 19, two years older than Anastasia, and he simply thought that the skeleton fitted better. He didn't think that any of the skeletons were young enough to belong to Anastasia, but also he'd seen numerous photos of Anastasia and she was significantly shorter than her sisters. And this just didn't match up with any of the skeletons he had in front of him. His findings went completely against Abramov, who still believed that Maria was the missing daughter. And so the mystery of Anastasia, the lost princess, begins. In July 1992, the British Home Office agreed to DNA test the remains themselves, which was all very embarrassing for the Russians, who didn't like the fact they were quite behind in science, particularly in genetics. A quote from Russian scientist Nikolai Nevelin said, we were working on molecular genetic testing at one time. Academic Vavilov began using this method. Then Mr. Stalin shot his entire team and as a result, we began lagging behind. Russia. The British would be able to test for a family connection between the bodies and if enough uncontaminated DNA could be extracted, then they would be able to test this DNA against living blood relatives of the Romanovs to confirm once and for all that this was definitely them. And who are the living blood relatives of the Romanovs? Only our royal family themselves, of course. King George V was a first cousin of both Nicholas and Alexandra. So in 1992, samples of the femur bones were sent to the British and Prince Philip, that's right, donates blood to test against the blood of Alexandra. Because even though Prince Philip was not a blood relative of King George, he was the great nephew of Alexandra. Royalty, it's all a bit incesty. And lo and behold, it was a match. They could confirm at least that these were the remains of Alexandra and three of her children. This couldn't confirm Nicholas, but it stands to reason that he was probably also there. It takes a while to find a relative of Nicholas who was willing to have their DNA tested, but they eventually do, and yay, it's finally confirmed in 1993 that Nicholas was indeed Nicholas, and the Romanovs were indeed the Romanovs. So the family are buried in the St. Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Petersburg. But Anastasia was still not there or maybe Maria, and rumours begin to fly of the Princess Anastasia living in hiding, scared to come out and say who she was. Or like the cartoon suggests, maybe she'd suffered a brain injury and complete amnesia about who she was. There have been so many people to come out of the woodwork over the years claiming to be the missing Anastasia. I think that might be a whole video in itself, I think this one's already a little bit too long. But all hopes and dreams people had of being this missing princess died in August 2007, when a Russian archaeologist announced that he had discovered two partial skeletons at a bonfire site in Pig's Meadow. A set of 44 bone fragments and teeth were removed from the site, and it was determined that the bones belonged to two young individuals, a young male aged 12 to 15, and a young woman aged 15 to 29, and they'd been buried there for more than 60 years. DNA testing affirmed that this was one female and one male child of Tsar Nicholas II, whether that be Anastasia or Maria. There will never be any way of knowing for sure which is which, and thus ends the mystery of the Romanov family, 
all members are accounted for. Now due to a whole load of political and religious stuff, the Orthodox Church actually refused to accept that these are indeed the bodies of the Roman of children and therefore they're refusing to bury them alongside the rest of their family. So at the moment they remain in storage which is a pretty undignified end for royalty. And there you go, that is a story of the Romanov family. Probably not as much of a mystery as the media would lead you to believe, or at least it's not much of a mystery anymore. All Romanovs present and accounted for. Russian history is just crazy guys. I've got so many stories I could tell you about Russian history. So of course, let me know if there's anything you wanna know about down below. It doesn't just have to be Russian. Any history thing that you wanna know about, let me know down below. I have some really interesting history videos planned. I hope you guys are enjoying this series as much as I am. It's just something a little bit fresh, a little bit different. It's not doing quite as well as my mystery series, but I enjoy filming these videos so, so much. I'm loving this at the moment. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all your support. And I suppose I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.